everybody, and welcome to A Gem of a Secret Podcast. My name is Donna, tell my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. But you can just call me Donna. How you doing tonight, Coco? I am doing... Actually, I'm, I'm really somber, actually, because yeah. of everything that's happening in the world right now. Yeah. Like, it's uh, kind of scary, and to a degree. Yeah, yeah, things just kind of keep intensifying, it feels, as yeah. the weeks go on. Um but interesting news that Donna just told me before we started, um, apparently a uh, Pornhub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Russia has been blocked by Pornhub. Um, and that's happening with a lot of businesses. Yeah, like I, I read an article today that Adidas and McDonald's, uh, Starbucks, uh, and then Coke and Pepsi have all pulled. And the one thing I did read about, I think it was Starbucks or McDonald's, they're actually still paying the workers. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously to not hurt them, but they're yeah. no longer like the stores are closed. Yeah. I think is what it was. The McDonald's said their stores are closed, but they're still paying the workers. Hmm. And I think there was like 850 hmm. McDonald's in Russia. Like that's Damn. like, and I was the funny thing when I heard that news, I, cause I'm a fat kid and all of the stuff that they're pulling are things I enjoy. So Porn, they're not sending them what... any like more supply of things yeah. basically yeah no more supply of things actually it's from it sounds like the mcdonald's store just closed they closed i don't know what starbucks mm-hmm. is doing um but like i was thinking about like could you even imagine like i mean i know those are all big chains but like, yeah and we live in a pretty artsy place with a lot of like smaller businesses but like going through and just like seeing all the mcdonald's is closed seeing all the starbucks is closed mm-hmm. and just like walking through your city and just being like what the hell like it's hard to think about. I I think eventually it's going to be something that happens. Honestly, I think we are at the later stages of capitalism, and we mm-hmm. may witness that. It's something that I think, honestly, would be a good thing. Um, I think that there's a lot of exploitation in our society as it stands right now. Yeah, I feel that that's true, yeah. So seeing more of a transition to uh mom and pop shops and you know uh, community owned stores and um yeah yeah basically more mutual aid i think is something that we need to do i think Um, that that, i i agree i think that that would be incredibly beneficial i know that we all get into the rut of capitalism in the mm -hmm. sense of like what's easier what we know like even like a powerhouse like amazon even though amazon gives back a lot like because they have their charity program right that you can everything you purchase can go through charity and that's great but like when you have those powerhouses like i'm one of those people who don't want to think yeah um i've actually just recently just as a side note is um i i can't find like this it it applies listeners just bear with me Mm -hmm. i can't really find clothes in my size being a bigger woman yeah like and i can't find cute clothes i can't find drag clothes and like every like big woman store out there just doesn't seem to ever really offer anything i Mm -hmm. can never find anything cute on amazon ever like Mm -hmm. that ever like fits with what everybody else can do like oh yeah i bought that bodysuit on on amazon Mm -hmm. blah 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 blah. like it doesn't fit me it won't fit me it doesn't have my size and so i've been actually shopping a lot more you know smaller yeah businesses smaller businesses that that cater cater to my size and i will admit it is a little bit more expensive and when i order something it takes forever to arrive yeah but i just ordered these two dresses um that i saw on uh, it was just like uh, a small business owner like she has a website it's just her she makes all the clothes Uh the clothes came they're gorgeous well tailored i put them on with my full drag body and i and it makes me feel better it does like than buying that stuff from those bigger companies like it does it did it made me like i know the system can work i know that we're creatures of habit and we like ease like but it's also was cool just supporting like this small creative person yeah who who makes plus size clothing Yeah. yeah yeah So, sure. Yeah, it even applied even on that scale. Yeah. Um, I forgot to ask, Donna, what are you wearing this evening? Coco, I am wearing a patchwork number of sorts with a bunch of denim. So I have some light denims, some dark denims, some acid wash denims. <laughs> denim, denim, denim. Denim, 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 denim. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Um, actually, I'm just wearing the gown that I was talking about earlier oh, out of drag. So that's yeah. why I look like a frumpy potato, but it's glittery. Lit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, actually, the reason, just as a side note again, yeah. the reason I bought these gowns is actually I am stepping down as Miss Sweetheart 33 of Portland 
with my husband, DJ Queer Cub, this Sunday as of the release of this episode mm-hmm. at CC Slaughter's at 6 or 7 o'clock p.m. Um, it's been a really crazy, hectic, and horrible and amazing year at the same time. So, yeah, yeah. Go into a little bit of detail on how that's been for you. Yeah, so the Sweethearts of Portland is an organization that um, just raises money for other charities. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're 501c3, and they just give money to other charities. And it's been, it was a offshoot of the ISRC, which is Imperial Sovereign Rose Court mm-hmm. of Portland. Um, and, yeah, so... It, they've just been raising money. They've obviously been around for 30, 30, 34 years. Yeah. And it's a really great organization. Like, and I've, and like, it's super unique in the sense that there's not a pageant. You don't mm-hmm. win by wearing a pretty gown. You win by whoever you're running with mm-hmm. in the same title, like Miss. There's an MX title for our non binary and trans community members. There's a Mr. title as well. And you just raise the most money with whatever title you're going for and then that's how you win and i yeah. love that i love yeah. cuz and this year we're raising money for the black resilience fund and uh the sweethearts of portland and just as a small side note uh the black resilience fund actually helped out close friends of mine during yeah. covid um they provide like financial help and other kind of help to mm-hmm um black families that's awesome and it, it was a really cool thing so it's been a great that's year that's so cool yeah you know so that's the sunday i'm so excited check it out but as we're talking about events actually donna and i have an event that we're gonna tell you guys about yeah at the end of this month yeah on the very last day of march yeah we are going to be doing a little sober social it's where you can come out and meet us, listeners. Yeah. Finally. So it's going to be kind of an introduction to our, what we're going to be doing for the live version of this podcast. And it is going to be a sober event. Um, but like we said in the last episode, you know, it's all dependent on how you feel on your sobriety journey on if you're, you know, ready to go out to an event like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited to meet y'all and i'm excited to meet you know more people who are kind of on this journey of sobriety that i've been on and even if you're not even if you do partake and you just want to check it out then we would love to see you there Um, yeah so they're trying this new thing at the queen's head where they're actually trying to create a environment that is also sober like so they're from my understanding and i'm sorry if we get it wrong or they get it wrong but they're trying to like black out all the liquor like by putting up curtains and stuff like that so it's mm-hmm. not even sitting there as a reminder yeah because sometimes you know people when they get sober they don't want those reminders of like how bad it got right yeah. so we're also doing that there is going to be a drag show that happens later in the evening and they've actually decided to do an all sober cast for that as well yeah uh, donna's going to be participating in that so that's yeah. really exciting and you'll get to see kind of um just a new version of me i think i'm yeah yeah, and well, and the other thing that's really cool is you do get to meet us and talk with us, yeah. and we can talk about uh, the journey that we've had on the podcast. Donna, Donna can talk about her journey in sobriety, and like it's just going to be so cool to meet you, listeners. Like it's like our first live event. Like we're famous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's going to be real cool. So Although we're not. Yeah, we're not famous. I'm incredibly humble. I recognize that I am just a hermit that lives in. <laughs> <laughs> in I thought my you were room. say squalor, and I was like, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I felt like it was going. With I mean, essentially, I I am poor, so. Um... <laughs> oh God! Hopefully, this takes off. <laughs> you know, like so we're gonna meet somebody who's just gonna be like, you know what? I just love what you're doing, but listeners. You're great. my only hope. <laughs> <laughs> they want to know me. You're my only hope. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> um so for the other things that we were going to talk about for the first uh section of this episode is that you know like we do know that these subjects are really heavy like when we talk about Ukraine and Russia and mm-hmm. things like that and I we've been having dialogues about like what we wanted to talk about on the podcast cuz not knowing like we don't want to necessarily provide you more trauma or provide you like more negativity in your life but we do want to be able to talk about these social issues and Mm -hmm. these popular issues and these world issues 
and give our perspective on them and maybe help you all just feel like you have somebody else who understands where you're coming from because they are hard subjects. Yeah, it's it's hard stuff to break down. And honestly, we are not experts really on much. I, <laughs> in general. <laughs> in general, you know, I'm hardly an expert on things in the psychology realm, but that's, you know, I'm just starting my journey and going to school for all of that stuff. So, um, and then Coco is really great with computers and whatnot. But other that, other than that, we definitely are trying to break down things in real time, like a lot of y'all are. Yeah. Um, although we do have, you know, varied interests in, you know, politics and and whatnot. Um, a lot of the time, we are just trying to put things into layman's terms for anyone who might be listening to this. So then they kind of have a more approachable way of of understanding some of these things as we try to understand them. Yeah, actually, that's a beautiful way of saying that. Um, and even so, as we talk about these issues and whatever, we do want you guys to have conversations with us as well. Yeah. Like, you can write us on our website about the things that we're talking about, and or you can start coming to some of our live events and yeah. say, like, I super didn't agree with that, or saying I did agree with that. And we yeah. will give you the space to have that civil discourse with us mm -hmm. and have those conversations. And I know that nothing that we say is usually too, like horrible in any capacity mm -hmm. but it'd be great to hear feedback from all of you yeah um but before we get too far into that donna how are you doing this evening oh i will let you know after this brief break it's a podcast it with coco and donna tell a podcast tune into what they tell you podcast with coco and donna tell a podcast I am feeling nostalgic. I'm feeling like when I used to ride my bike around my neighborhood and hang out with all my friends when I was a kid. Because we're talking about our inner child. Yeah, our inner children's. Children's. It actually got brought up. Donna brought this up because of there's this uh, event that happens every drag race um, where RuPaul will, you know, hold up pictures of the person as a kid. Yeah. And what would you say to little blah, blah, blah? Tommy... Two fingers. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Why did I Tommy say that? <laughs> I, do I don't know. I, um, I, don't, I also don't know where Tommy got that nickname. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. So basically it's – I find – I used to find it extremely cringy when that moment would happen mm -hmm. on Drag Race. And it wasn't, I, I think, until I started going to therapy that <laughs> I realized that it actually is a, a very good therapeutic technique. Um, because basically, one of the main points, I think, of healing ourselves as adults is to kind of reparent ourselves and to make our inner childs proud of ourselves. Hmm. And for me... In the last year, one thing that that has been has been self-acceptance. Mm. When people don't have unconditional love growing up, they are raised on conditional love. Mm -hmm. They lack any kind of self-acceptance and self... What am I trying to say? Confidence. Uh, so, Self-confidence. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, self-actualization is actually like the psychology yeah. term for it. So um, we, you have very low self-actualization when you are raised with conditional love in your household. And so for me, it has mm -hmm. been accepting the parts that my family rejected in me and fostering kind of that strangeness, that queerness, and that weirdness that I, I was, I had to stifle for so many years growing up. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I I can see that for you, definitely. And I think that, like, your year of sobriety, your year of, like, discovering yourself and really looking in the mirror and seeing if you like the person that you see staring back at you mm -hmm. has actually kind of opened the door to that conversation even more. Yeah. Because, like, I always think about what I would say to that photo in the same in the same thing like we've yeah. talked about like everybody talks about it like when you're a drag artist we always talk about what you would say yeah for mine which it relates to yours heavily is i i had mostly unconditional love but the way i grew up is that my mom had foster children or whatever so my mom had a lot of love she had to divvy out and i felt like i was lacking mm. in that love yeah and so which i don't think i've ever said before um out loud but i always yeah. felt like i had to share not my parent, I had to share emotional stability. Mm. Um, and that's why I'm, by the way, that's why I'm so independent. Yeah. Is because I had to be as a kid. Yeah. Um, 
But the thing is, I would say to the photo is I, I was always certain of my decisions from a very young age. There was a brief period in college when I like hated every single thing about myself, mm-hmm. um, in the sense of my personality, and mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily change it. But like it was, I wanted. I this is, sounds so conceited. I would tell the photo to stay on the freaking path. Yeah, like your the decisions you think at that age are correct. Yeah. Like you just have to stay the course and you're going to be pulled in a thousand different directions to thinking that what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. And I was like, you will, I was like, when you are me, you will not have regrets about how the decisions you've made. Mm. And I was like, but you are going to feel like you should have made every other choice possible. Mm. Remember you want a good life. You want love. You want a stable career and you want friends. These are the yeah. things that drove you from birth. Yeah. Like, just keep with that. Yeah. And then I'd probably just tell them to just uh, not take things so seriously. Yeah. As I'm yelling at them. Don't take this conversation yeah. so seriously. So, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> no, that's important. And it is interesting how your experience does differ from mine, but also we have our similarities as well. Yeah, because I would um, think that, like, th- this is actually, this is funny. This is what I would tell your inner child. Uh, well, tell you <laughs> as a child. Yeah. Um, I would be like, listen, like, you are going to be faced with some of the hardest situations any human person has had to deal with outside of death. <laughs> yeah. And you make it, and that's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, like, you are going to find every single thing possible to make your to make it to where you can get to the next phase. Yeah. And I was like, and some of them were bad decisions, some of them were good decisions. I was like, but the one thing that's always true about you is that you should always look for creative outlets to help yourself get to the next phase in a healthy way. I think that's what I would have said to your kid. Honestly, I think that's some solid sound advice for my inner child. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do. Well, I would, I, you know, I would definitely go into how a lot of the conclusions that I'm going to reach in my life are going to be through very horrible, <laughs> um, very horrible, difficult times, honestly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that to try and like have like, pity or anything for Mm -hmm. like where I've been but I you know I have learned a lot of what I've learned through hard lessons it hasn't been through um through very easy means and um uh, some of it is you know a lot of it is self-inflicted a lot Mm -hmm. of it was because I I lacked self-worth and because I was constantly chasing validation from other people and I was also Mm -hmm. you know at the same time numbing out a lot of a lot of the hatred and a lot of the guilt that I felt about myself, um, just growing up queer and growing up religious, you know, um, there were so many times that I prayed to this God that my family, you know, told me to believe in that I wouldn't be the way that I am, you know, that I wouldn't be queer in any way and that I could just be straight and, and not be different. And so like that self-hatred manifested, um, through many years and it took, a lot of years of just like projecting on other people and I would say that the work starts with myself it starts with doing inner work it starts with making this inner child proud that I would be facing and about so for your story too like so one thing about Donna which we've kind of hinted before is like both her and I have never really had a problem in the friendship department and this is like we've always had friends in the phases of our lives yes like Donna was popular in high school and whoop de whoop de whoop and yes some of those friendships are fake or whatever but like we always had people around we've always yeah. had people to talk to and things like that but those things it's funny because like those things don't actually save you from the bad like having no. friends don't especially in I feel like before college age like friends don't really save you from the bad they just make you not feel as sad about it (laughs) yeah yeah and then you have some that like when you start coming out as being an authentic version of yourself that leave and and that definitely happened and i think any any queer person can relate to that yeah i remember i remember and this is older in life but like i had a friend once who was a cross-dresser who Mm -hmm. dipped out of my life Because they didn't like a comment I made on a microphone once. Mm -hmm. And they said, I'll be friend with the out of drag version of you, but the in drag version of you is a person I no longer want to associate with. Mm. And that was 
really hard because like I think at that time I didn't really understand my bi genderness. Mm-hmm. Um, which I I've explained that I'm bi gender on this podcast before, but like I think it's like when as a bi gender person when somebody denies an aspect of yourself, mm-hmm. it was like really damaging. Yeah. Right at that level, and the in the same way. So like even as a kid, as a kid, um, and actually speaking about my inner child, and then also me as a kid, um, I wore dresses as a kid. Um, I thought they were fun and flowy, and I got like yelled at and told I was wrong, and like told all of these things that like you know shape you as an adult. And I recognize, like, I was a, a feminine kid, mm-hmm. um, and my dad was a very manly man, and everything that I did, he consistently made me feel like I wasn't manly enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, neglect came from that as well, because my dad, the way that my dad wanted to toughen me up is by putting me into sports. But my Same. dad was so neglectful that he never actually did it. You know how damaging it is to have a dad saying you're not manly enough, I'm putting you in sports, and then it's just too neglectful to actually do it? Like, yeah. that is that is a whole world of trauma that a therapist would love to attack. <laughs> like, so it was just like having every problem with you and then not even showing up. And when... not even trying to fix it. Right? Yeah. Like, I hate your personality. You need to be in football. Okay, I guess I'm signing up for football. Never signs me up for football. (laughs) Mm. Like, so stupid. And and the thing is, like, I think that when Donna said about your inner child being proud of you. Yeah. I don't know if mine would necessarily be proud of me because I always see... I could always push myself to be better in a lot of different aspects, like personality-wise, career-wise. Not career, goal-wise. Personality and goal-wise. I think my inner child would be like, be like, you're so close. I mm-hmm. think that's what mine would do all the time. Not because of perfectionism, but like, I understand how lazy I am and the things and the dreams I want to have. Yeah. Yeah. I think my inner child would be proud of me for how I express myself nowadays. Like, mm. I always wanted a mohawk as a kid and I always wanted like edgy things that my, you know, like my family wouldn't allow me to have. And like right now in my spiritual side, I'm really into um, a lot of like traditional Gaelic Celtic traditions and um, different type of uh, like pagan stuff. Mm. Um witchcraft like tarot and whatnot things that i was never really allowed to do um in a christian household because it was seen as so taboo and so of the devil you know of the dark side oh, yeah i get that um that i think my inner child would be really proud of me for expressing myself in those ways because it's always something that i was drawn to as a kid but wasn't allowed to to do so in that mm. way and in, in in my outward expression i think they would be proud um i don't think I think the areas that I could work on making my inner child more proud is to actually have ambition and like drive to do more of my creative endeavors, like you said. Um, yeah, I think that yeah, to that dive head first. Ambition into that. is a better word. Yeah, um, drive sure, but ambition. I think I think I have a lot of ambition, but I I sometimes get too lazy to actually get to the finish line. Yeah, and I I could see that actually because with what I know about your childhood, I think that you expressing yourself in this way would make your inner child proud Mm -hmm. because you do have a mohawk right now and whatever and like and you do have a lot of alternative interests that paint my nails i wear skirts i wore a skirt to work for the first time like a few (laughs) weeks ago and yeah you know just different things like that on cut jams have you you seen have you seen that sound on tiktok that on cut jams no things like that No, oh my god, I haven't. <laughs> I, I I swear, it's so funny to, and this is a completely different tangent that we're going off on, but it's so funny to, like, be sitting next to someone else who's on TikTok and see what their For You page is like in comparison to mine, Oof. because mine is, like, just some of the dumbest shit that I, I'll be like, oh my gosh, this is so stuck in my head, and... There is one coworker that it, usually hers is the same as mine, and we will be like, "Yep, we're on the same TikTok for you page." But a lot of the times, like especially with my boyfriend, I'll be like, "Have you heard this TikTok sound?" And I'm like laughing about it, and he's like, "No," and I don't even get the joke. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say that, but I can see it. Like when I show it to him, he's just like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, I, no, I get it. Like I am um, my TikTok. I don't have a lot of drama in my life right now, and because I've said that, it's going to happen in days. But like. I, uh, I've been following the stupid 
Chelsea and Lance thing. And like, oh my gosh, uh, deep. I hate in, myself. Deep <laughs> in my womb, lands or <laughs> deep, deep in my womb. I know womb lands. Womb, womb lands. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. That remix Are that you, someone you made of it. You fucking knew. <laughs> you fucking knew. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's okay. It's it's alarming and like yes, it's a side note. So I'll just have to explain it real quick, real quickly, listeners. So you're yeah. just like, what the hell just happened? It's the power so, of white woman tears. Uh, yes. So there was uh, two influencers who mm-hmm. uh, dated, and one of them, uh, the male party, um, did not tell um, the female party that they were um, sleeping with multiple people. Is pretty yeah. Much what yeah, uh, uninformed consent. Yeah, uninformed consent. And so didn't give her, which robs her of the ability to say, would she have sex with him without a condom or not? Yeah. And so she had sex with him without a condom, found out that he's been sleeping with multiple women without protection. Uh-huh. And so, of course, she needs to get tested. She might be pregnant, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But she went on a tirade, and they're both heavy influencers. Yes. And yeah. And so she kind of went on a tirade. Where at first, it's like everybody was really sympathetic to the situation. But then as she kept making more videos about the situation, it felt really over-dramatized and in a way that was really harming. And then she did have a lot of white women tears, even though she's not white present. She's white presenting, but she's not white. Yeah. And um, which caused so much back harm to the Native American man. Yeah. To where he did have to move. And actually, he, he's kind of been off of t- They've both been off of TikTok now for a couple of days. To yeah. Be but everybody had a really large opinion on the scenario. Because they tried to conflate, like, sexual assault mm-hmm. with this. They made it sound like uh, he was sleeping with underage kids. like, uh, like Which it, has since been... Which has all been disproven. disproven. Um, a lot of people got involved and a lot of drama happened. A and, lot of people got involved and a lot of drama happened. Yeah, Aunt Karen on TikTok got involved and she, like, made some defamatory states uh, statements against Lance. By the way, the reason that I am bringing this up is that it's been bothering me a little bit... Um, for the last several months about when people handle their business so publicly. Yeah. Um, and it, and that was a true case because so many influencers on TikTok had an opinion about something that mm-hmm. they really just didn't have in the business having an opinion on. Yeah. But when you have like 2.2 million followers and TikTok is really good about showing videos to people. Yeah. Like it was, it was pretty alarming. Yeah. And these are both two like, very much so social justice TikTokers. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they it's definitely like it was a very uncomfortable situation to watch. And it's still all over TikTok. It's still all, all over, my, over all over everyone's for you page right now. Um, and yeah. I think one big I think probably the best video I saw in response to it was that when something like this happens to an indigenous man, the society makes it to where the response is nothing but a violent response. Um, because people, uh, Lance already did have a lot of backlash from white, su- white supremacists and Trump supporters. Um, so much so that they were like trying to dox him. He had a lot of people that hated on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, I think that's also something to important to point out that yes, it's great to, um, it's important to hold people accountable, especially when like her, you know, if, if they do things that are deemed you know, fairly horrific. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have to recognize that the culture right now creates a environment to where a lot of the times indigenous men and, and people of color, um, instead of being just like holding them accountable for things like that, it, it ends up violent because there is this system of supremacy of white supremacy that is around. Um, And that is a side of it that a lot of, you know, white counterparts don't have to consider when something like this happens to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to view this from a more caring um, view and just understand the context of what we're dealing with when things like this happen in a public landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I made a comment today about a friend. uh, I actually want to go back to my inner child stuff with this. Yeah. I made a comment today to a friend. They said, are you going to a show tonight? And actually, it was a show that Green is in, actually. And Mm -hmm. I had said, um, this person has caused me such aggressive public harm Mm -hmm. that I do not want to be in spaces near or around them. Yeah. I was like, the level of anti-blackness that they are feeding into, regardless if they're actually racist or not, is causing me such 
harm, mm-hmm. continual aggressive harm mm-hmm. to the point of where people have sided so much with this person that they like one it was not necessarily hurting my drag career but what will happen is like it'll create tense and uncomfortable environments mm-hmm. with people saying things about me that i overhear or they will try to get me fired from places or they will try to create these emotional like like weapons against me when mm-hmm. i'm in spaces and i basically told my friend i was like i can't be there because mm-hmm. I could be emotionally and to the point recently it feels like I could be physically harmed by a reputation that somebody has cultivated around me yeah like the and so I was like so I need to be removed from that I'm not even saying that these people are intentionally violent mm-hmm. but what the the atmosphere that they created has caused harm yes which is what happened to Lance yes like, yeah and so that's why I was like I like, that's why when I said I would talk to my inner child and be like, try not to let people get to you. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, in my adult life, I haven't really responded outside of this podcast to some of the negative things that have happened to me. And and people's reactions to even this this podcast have been aggressive when yeah. I speak up for myself. And then other people are also harmful, wondering why I haven't spoken up for myself. Yeah, And it's like, because in my 30s, like, that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. is not healthy for me no so i would tell my inner child being like it's gonna suck Mm -hmm. but like you really can't participate in conversations and dialogues that are going to people will spin your narratives however they want you to make you feel like a villain but like if you can if you feed into that you will get nothing from that yeah because like right now my life is actually i have a lot of great things in it but i have a really good example Recently, there were cops all over our neighborhood, all over our neighborhood, because somebody um, almost crashed a car into a house, and it was some white dude. And I was with a friend of mine who was white, and he was driving me home from a bar. And what happened was, um, and I was wearing a do-rag, first time I ever wore a do-rag in public, by the way, and I was driving home. Well, I I was in the passenger seat, and the cops kept coming up to my side of the vehicle, and it was just like racism.com. Like, and I do feel this way about Green and every single person that agrees with Green is because I have to be mad calm. Yeah. When white people get the overabundance of privilege of getting to react however they so choose. Yeah. And that kills me. Yeah. Because when I'm sitting in this passenger seat with my do-rag on, with my little camo vest on and whatever, and I have all these white, all of them white, police officers coming up to the window and like asking me questions like making it seem like i don't live there like gaslighting me and just putting me in all these situations and you have to be calm because i can end up being harmed yeah right and like they literally here's the point of the story that i want to get to they asked me for my id to see if i lived in the neighborhood and even though they were looking for a white man my friend who is white the cop also asked him for his id He couldn't find it. It turned out later that I was sitting on his wallet. And he just couldn't find it. The cop just didn't care. And then he said, "What what are you doing tonight? And I said, he picked me up from a bar. The cop looks at my white, the white cop looks at my white friend and said, that's really kind of you. Thank you for doing that. Uh Never gets his ID. Never. Just told Uh us to pull over so the dogs continue searching for the white man. That is the anti-blackness that I'm talking about. That is the harm that I'm talking about. And that is like the over umbrella of racism that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So when I would talk to my inner child and be like, it would be like, don't sweat the small stuff, but also don't be stupid. Yeah. Like, because these people will continually harm you in that way and they'll never get it. All they're able to say is like, well, I'm not racist, and she's using the race card. She, yeah, you're playing the race card without without fully understanding the context and the conditions that you're living under. And the thing is, unless unless as a uh, here's the thing, white people, unless as a white person you're actively going against the conditions and actively trying to dismantle them, if you're adding to um, rhetoric that is uh, towards a black person, and because of the conditions of the system is. In, in ways anti-black, you are part of the problem. Yes. You are part of the problem unless you are actively anti-racist and like doing things to dismantle this and also have some empathy for 
the people of color in your life and in the uh, scenes that you interact with them in, Mm -hmm. you are part of the problem. Yeah. If you look to your left and look to your right and you all find out that majority of your white friends that you're talking to about this person you don't like and they also don't like them and you're just looking around the room and it's mostly white people, like, you should really reflect on that conversation. You're adding to those volatile conditions. You're adding... You are. You're adding it to the where moving through life has made it to where I have to be sure about Mm -hmm. what I'm doing and where I'm going and how I operate to yes. not be emotionally or physically harmed by the atmosphere that has been created from yes. someone that chose not to like me. I think you have to be incredibly careful. I think, you know, obviously everyone, everyone is subject to critique for the way that they handle things and mm-hmm. the way that things go down in their life and whatnot. Yeah. But we have to be actively aware of the systemic conditions that exist in this country and in society for people of color and the ramifications that come from galvanizing a group of people against them. Ooh, that's good. That's real good. <sighs> well, that gave me chills that one did. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, yeah, you do, good. you do. And I think that also when relating to this situation about your inner child, it's something that I never have to consider. Yeah, it's something that I will never I never have to consider the best thing that I can do as a friend and as someone who has many people of color in my life that I love is to try and be there for them and try to understand as best as I can through through learning and and not leading in that situation, because I think if there's one thing that we've learned, it's that. People in the white majority of this country have had the loudest voice for the longest time. And it is time for, especially in situations like this, to sit back, listen, and understand where this hurt is coming from and and really under truly understand how we can do better to make sure that the systems that are in place can be dismantled and just be better towards people. You know? Yeah, I agree. And But here's the thing. I'll give you this, though. There is something to be said, because we did grow up in that time, listeners, Mm. where Donna had a lot of, yeah, she had, you know, the two-parent, two-kid household thing, but there Mm. were expectations about who she was going to be. Yes. Like, the straight football player who married married their college sweetheart and had 2.5 kids and whoop-de-whoop-de-whoop. Yeah. And, like, and that, that lifestyle oftentimes can lead... To somebody, like, when they, especially when they decide to come out of the closet or tell people they're coming out of the closet, it can lead to such harm and damage, which yeah. actually Donna has most of the stories. It's actually, if you listen back to our coming out episodes that we did, I think last year, it's actually a part of that. It's actually yeah. it was a really, really difficult time for Donna in her life because of that, being the golden boy to coming out of the closet and what that picture looks like and the abandonment that she actually felt from those situations. Yeah. Like, it. It's difficult on both sides for different reasons. It is. Like, we have, like, this isn't, like, I know that people would feel a way about me saying that, but this isn't the oppression oppression Olympics. When it comes to queer experiences, yes, there are intersectional issues that happen, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, if you completely not, like, I didn't have the golden boy syndrome. Yeah. My dad wanted those things for me, but I was a statistic of a black kid, and he was not involved, right? So my mom... Like, I did have that point where, you know, it happened with my mom a little bit where she wasn't accepting, but she got on board fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that, it's different, right? Yeah. I did have to, and then like, and then of course later in life it comes with a whole slew of issues about how you handle those things later in life. And so Mm -hmm. all I want to get at with Donna saying that really kind thing is that both of these situations were incredibly hard. And like, that's what things, that's cringy about the RuPaul thing is because we're not there yet to where the coming out stories have stopped being hurtful, right? Like, there is going to be a new generation, like the Gen Zers, mm-hmm. um, who, a, I don't know how big a population, but there's going to be a good majority of them who have good coming out stories. Yeah. And accepting parents. Yeah. I'm still, like, as a millennial myself, like, most of my friends' coming out stories are jarring as hell. Yeah. No, I, I would <laughs> say that, that that's very 
accurate and representative of the generations. I think we find that a lot of the times with some of the Gen Z queens that are on the younger queens, they do have those very supportive families a mm -hmm. lot of the time. I, I won't say it's all the time because it's definitely not the case. Right, right. I still see kids on TikTok getting kicked out of their houses for being queer. Yeah. So it's, it's something that's still very much so happening, especially in the South and especially in middle America. Yeah. But I, I think what you said definitely has so much there's there's so much there with that and it's it's something that we've kind of talked about in the past on this podcast and it's that everyone that you see is living a complex life just as your own if not more complex mm -hmm. and and more um difficult in ways yeah you know and so understanding that and having empathy for people um even if they are different from us i think is is the first step towards really understanding people and also also, I think in a lot of ways, dismantling those systems that I was talking about earlier is just understanding that there's a lot of nuances and complexities to someone else's life. And if you're adding to the strife in that, then, you know, you're Shame you're part of the problem. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because and then also where I want to leave it, too, on this subject is that recognizing that a lot of people are going through things. But I haven't gotten to the point in my life, like Lawanda Jackson, famous drag queen that everybody in Portland knows, um, been on, been in movies and everything, amazing person. She always said, she always tells the person, thank you. And she always forgives and like, well, not always, but like tries to forgive. And she always says, thank you when people come at her too hard. Yeah. And there's a whole concept behind that. But here's the thing. I think I've learned about myself recently. Yeah. I don't forgive the people that harm me. Mm. I, it's really, really hard to do that. I know, like you, we all see the Lifetime movie, you know, where the person killed someone's mom and whatever, and so the, you know, the testimonies, like they come up, they're like, I just, I forgive this person mm -hmm. for what they did because I need to move on with my life. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I can forgive a person if I don't ever have to see them again. <laughs> and like that's that's easier. Do you think by not forgiving you're then holding on to resentments um i have found that it's a good defense that's the problem mm. so when i hold on to remembering why this person hurt me when they ultimately especially in my life when they ultimately do something again mm -hmm. i have the protection the emotional protection of the thing that they are going to harm me with in the future. Mm -hmm. Like I have found that a lot of my bad situations in life come with continual harm. Yeah. Like I rarely have somebody harmed me and then gets out of my life. It's like that person will consistently keep doing things to harm me. Mm. And like, and that, and that has been, that has been just such a true story in my life. Yeah. And that's why it's been difficult for me to forgive and forget or forgive and move on because that, like, I'm getting to the point to where I think I can forgive my ex-husband, mm -hmm. but I don't ever have to see that person again. Yeah. Like, yeah. that person can't cause me continual harm. In this community, though, I run into people consistently that harm me. Yeah. I think I think my view on forgiveness has changed a lot since I've grown up. I have a, I have a tattoo on my left wrist that says forgive in typewriter font, and I got that tattoo um, as the t at the time where I was coming around me and my family weren't really talking at the time. It was still part of those two years where we were fairly estranged. And um, I even remember I didn't wish my dad happy birthday right after I got this tattoo. It was around the same time because we were so far apart in, in our relationship. Um, and that obviously caused resentments. But at the time, I felt like you have to forgive in order to um, really forgive yourself. I think... I think that's the biggest thing is you should forgive yourself first. Um, a lot of the times forgiveness is for the other person. And yeah. um, unless you can really work through it, um, I don't think you should. I think you should only forgive when you're ready to. Yeah. But if you can't forgive, I think one of the things that you can do, and this is actually g going back to Drag Race, the UK versus the world finale was tonight, and Rue said something uh, along the lines of releasing those resentments that you're mm. holding against other people in the world. I kind of like that. Actually. Yeah. Cause the forgiveness thing just feels like a crock of crap sometimes, but yeah. Giving away those resentments uh -huh. I think is fine. Cause like I have built relationships with people that 
have harmed me, Mm -hmm. but I've let go of the resentments I've had for them because Mm -hmm. those don't serve me. It's poison. Yeah. It's It's poison. It's poison. It's poison. It doesn't serve me at all, so give it away because I need to feel better and feel healthy. Yeah. That I can get behind a lot more. Yeah. And honestly, you know, when you say God, for me, like God is nature. God is all of us. I think that there's God in every single one of us. So um, giving it away to whatever force keeps us around or whatever it is that you believe. And if if you're an atheist, then um, giving it to the universe, you know, whatever, mother nature, whatever, <laughs> mm-hmm. whatever is around us, you know, just releasing that energy. I, I, I think if you're atheist or not, you can, you can at least acknowledge that there is energy and to let go of certain resentments like that is something that is freeing for yourself and um, in turn free freeing in the other person, you can both move on. Yeah. Um, even if that, that doesn't mean being friends and, you know, there's, we can coexist, we can coexist and we can let go of things. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, let's leave it on that positive note. I love that. We wanted to try to leave it on something positive. Yeah. So thank you everybody for listening. Yeah. Thank you for listening. This was our episode on inner childs and TikTok. <laughs> yeah, exactly. TikTok uh, Ukraine and McDonald's. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Tune in next week and keep an eye out for our live event at the end of this month, March 31st at Queen's Head. Bye. Bye.